You're watching Jim Cannell on Today Television. This is Bible study for the 21st century. Welcome, friends. Jim Cantillon here. We're having a great time going through the book of Acts, and we're right in the story of Saul of Tarsus becoming St. Paul the Apostle. And we've just, last time, looked at his uh, Damascus Road experience, this amazing moment, uh, the ultimate conversion, if you will, uh, in the history of the church. And now we're going to see what happened next. So if you want to turn to Acts chapter 9, do it. We'll see you right after this. So what happened next? Uh, Paul has been led into Damascus, blinded by the light, healed by the Spirit of God through the ministrations of a, a man of God by the name of Ananias. Uh, and the ministry journey, if you will, is about to begin. Let's pick it up in verse 20 of Acts 9. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord, and the Lord had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Then the church throughout, the, throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. You know, uh, if you are, I was going to use the word astute, maybe that's... Uh, an unfair term, but if, if, if you are a keen observer, let's put it that way, of the scripture as you read it, you'll see sometimes things that 
don't appear to totally add up. And here, this is a case in point. You know, sometimes there's a, a great gulf fix between biography and autobiography. Uh, generally, the discrepancies lie at the feet of the biographer who tends to use a broad brush and seamlessly blend the colors. On the other hand, one tends to provide the finer points with attention to detail when one is writing one's own story. That's the difference between biography and autobiography. This helps one at least when reading through Luke's historical lens in the light of Paul's personal recollections in Galatians 1, 15 to the first verse of chapter 2. Now here's the Galatian account, and we've just read Luke's account, okay? Let's read Paul's own words about what was happening here. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went to Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I'm writing you is no lie. Then I went to Syria and Cilicia. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. Then after 14 years, after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem. Now, that's Paul's account. And, and you know, so you read Luke's account, the, the biographer, and then you read the autobiographical account. And you say, well, what's up here? Well, I'll tell you what's up here. Broad brush, biography, fine point, autobiography. What a historian will kind of sweep over and blend the autobiographer, autobiographical uh, writer will give you the details. And that's the difference. They're not at variance with one another. It's just that the broad brush strokes need to be countered with some of the finer points by the artist himself. Okay, I, I, enough, enough of the analogy. I think you get my point. So, after the drama of his conversion, Paul, was Saul, now we're calling him Paul, says he sought solace, and perhaps time for reflection, in the deserts of Arabia, whereas Luke says straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues. Well, the two are not uh, in opposition. It could very well be that um, in Paul's case, what he wants to emphasize is his reflective time in Arabia, whereas Luke wants to say, well, on his way, he did some preaching. It's just, you know, there's no point in trying to parse the details here. Then Paul says he went up to Jerusalem after three years. But Luke has him secretly escaping Damascus when many days had passed and going up to Jerusalem then. Again, biographer, autobiographer. Luke then says that Saul attempted to join the disciples, but because they feared and didn't believe him to be a true disciple, Barnabas took him under his wing and endorsed his legitimacy. But in Galatians, Paul says, his only contacts in Jerusalem were Peter and James, the Lord's brother. So that's just a case in point. You read a biography, you get the broad strokes. You read an autobiography, you get the details. I don't see any, any, any problem with this. If you do, then you're going to have to resolve it yourself. These, these kinds of discrepancies, if you want to call them that, are representative of occasional bumps on the road in recording history. Uh, the huge point, however, is this. And it, Saul proclaimed Jesus, saying he is the Son of God. Now, you might wonder about this, because Paul, in his pastoral epistles, warns some of his younger protégés, like Timothy and Titus and others, not to thrust any new believer into the ministry prematurely. They need time for reflection. They need time for education. They need time for developing their gifting, all right? So you look at Paul, and he, he's able, right from the get-go, to proclaim that Jesus is the Son of God. How could he do that? There's only one answer. He knew the Old Testament scriptures. He knew the prophets. He knew Isaiah 53. He knew all of what theologians call the suffering servant passages in Isaiah. Uh, he knew that the history of Messiah had been prophesied. 
he knew that Jesus was the suffering servant. He knew that. And when he's preaching in the Jewish synagogues, he's preaching from the Jewish scriptures, and he's using the Jewish scriptures to demonstrate beyond any doubt in his mind that Jesus is the Son of God. He was very convincing, not only because of his eloquence, but because of his, his education. He was better educated than anybody in the area. You know, in contemporary terms, he might have had three or four PhDs. This guy was bright, and he, he knew the scripture. He could speak three or four different languages. He understood the culture of the Greco-Roman Roman world. He understood the culture of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. He understood the, the parsing of the law by the scribes. He knew all of these things. He had sat at the feet of Gamaliel maybe for years after his education at the University of Tarsus. I mean, he was formidable. On top of that, he had the power of the Holy Spirit in his ministry. God, the Holy Spirit, had chosen him to be his vessel for bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. And so he kind of, if you will, cuts his teeth in the synagogues, which is basically a Jewish audience. But then he begins to spread out into the Gentile world. And he becomes more and more effective in presenting the gospel the longer he goes into uh, the far reaches of, the, uh, of um, the Middle East and Asia. He was a work in progress, but his point of beginning set him above any other person's point of beginning when it comes to coming to faith in Christ. Paul was truly God's chosen instrument for this purpose, and it was without doubt uh, his gifting from the Holy Spirit that enabled him to be as effective as he was. You know, there's something, that, and I don't want to be academic here, but something that's interesting. He had the intellectual capacity. He had the Greco-Roman appreciation for philosophy, and for reason. But at the same time, on the road to Damascus, he had experienced a profound revelation. And you know, some scholars have put it this way. The Greeks out of Athens looking for reason. The Jews and the Christians out of Jerusalem looking for revelation. Revelation, reason. Revelation, reason. The two are not necessarily at odds with one another. But the point is this, when you can add, if you will, the power of the revealed Spirit of Christ in combination with as much Bible and book learning as you can possibly achieve, you will be a force to be reckoned with. This isn't a case of just some kind of subjective pie in the sky. This is something that's deeply rooted in history and in the written Word of God. exactly what we do. Lives are changing. Why? Because Jesus is Lord. And why? Because Christians have come together as a body. The united body of Christ is coming and saying, it stops with this generation. We break it and we move on. The kind of religion that God endorses is to care for orphans and widows in their distress, justice, and to keep oneself unpolluted from the world, righteousness. What's interesting about Luke as an historian is that he can seamlessly jump from one character to the other without any transition. He's been dealing with Saul of Tarsus, now the Apostle Paul. 
called as a chosen instrument by God to be his witness to the Gentiles. But the ministry to the Gentiles did not start with Paul. It started with Peter. And so he just shifts seamlessly to Peter. Verse 32 of Acts 9. As Peter traveled about the country, he went to visit the Lord's people who lived in Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, who was paralyzed and had been bedridden for eight years. Aeneas, Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and roll up your mat. Immediately Aeneas got up, and all those who lived in Lydda, Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became sick and died, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lydda was near Joppa, so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, please come at once. Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room, and all the widows stood around, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. Okay, I'll just stop there for a moment. The Gospels of the Gentiles all started with Peter. It would appear that he had become an itinerant, as Luke says here in verse 32, traveling here and there among them all. Stephen's martyrdom had scattered the Jerusalem believers, so um, they were a dispersed flock in need of Episcopal oversight. So P Peter became the, the prominent pastor. And in his travels, he came down also to the saints that lived in Lydda. Now that Lydda is modern day Lod, which I know very well, having lived in Israel for seven years. But every time I've flown in and out of, of Israel, it's at the Lod airport, and that's Lydda, okay? And if you've been there, you've been to Lydda. Um, he, uh, he also was connecting with the believers in Joppa, and that would be modern-day Jaffa, which is uh, kind of a southern suburb of Tel Aviv on the coast. Uh, and he performed miracles, signs and wonders types of miracles that were expected of true apostles, even raising someone from the dead, as we just read, with Tabitha, Dorcas, and his reputation began to spread throughout the coastal region. But he's staying in Joppa, not in Lydda, uh, with a man by the name of Simon the Tanner. Uh, if you've been to Joppa, or Jaffa, as we call it now, um, you know it's the most beautiful setting. It's right there on the Mediterranean coast, and it's uh, pretty much a busy uh, commercial area right now, but uh, there's still parts of uh, Jaffa that are harken back to the time of the Crusaders and the early Romans, and you can visit some of those ruins, and it's absolutely beautiful. But he was staying somewhere there on the coast with Simon the Tanner. Then, guess what happens? Well, let's start with chapter 10. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need, prayed to God regularly. Uh, and I'll look at my uh, floor director and see how much time I got left here. Okay, okay, thank you, DJ. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord, he asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts of the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier, who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time, Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. 
This happened three times. And immediately the sheep, the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, these men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate. Go with them. I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, We have come from Cornelius the centurion. He's a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel asked him to ask you to come to his house so he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests, and the next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. Okay. Uh, Peter was a rustic Galilean provincial. He was a fisherman, blue-collar worker. Cornelius was an Italian man of the world. Uh, Peter was a Jew. Cornelius was a Gentile. And neither would have crossed the path of the other. They lived in separate worlds. But... They were drawn together <laughs> by the world from above. As a Roman centurion of the Italian cohort, uh, Cornelius would have been a prominent player in the military and also in the social life of Caesarea uh, because it was the capital of the Roman province of Judea. He was a man of influence. Interestingly, Luke says he was also a man of prayer with a heart for the poor. Boy, love for God, love for neighbor. We ever heard that before, righteousness and justice. And what's more, Cornelius was known as a God-fearer. God-fearer. This was a term used to describe a Gentile who believed that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was the true God and who had some sort of affiliation with a synagogue. Uh, he was not a proselyte, but he was an adherent to the Jewish faith, and he would have received no pushback from the liberal Roman culture. Rather, moderate syncretism was tolerated, if not encouraged. Better he should be this way, they would say out of Rome, because he'll have less trouble with the people. His piety, however, was a cut above so much so that it drew the attention of heaven itself. The Lord sent an angel to him with a message that ultimately would change the world. It was because of his love for God and his love for neighbor that he received this message from above. And in a vision, an angel of God, Luke says, instructed Cornelius to send men to Joppa to find Peter, who was staying at the seaside home of Simon the Tanner. And Cornelius chose two servants uh, and one of his men, a devout soldier, in other words, a fellow God-fearer, to go to Joppa. And they were made aware of his heavenly vision and were spiritually tuned to their task, no doubt about it. I've, uh, you know, in the, in the seven years that... Uh, my wife and our three little kids lived in Jerusalem when we were planting the King of Kings Church in Jerusalem. Uh, I many, many times, in fact, every week, I would drive the road that takes you from Jaffa, Jaffa to Caesarea and beyond. I would drive up the coastal highway, and I'd go across the valley of Jezreel, past places like uh, Megiddo and uh, uh, Sea of Galilee, up to the upper Galilee, past the Mount of Beatitudes, uh, right up to the northern border of southern Lebanon, where I would broadcast the gospel two shifts a week while I was also planting the church in Jerusalem. So I know this territory really, really well. I can almost drive it with my eyes closed, perish the thought. But um, it takes about an hour to drive from Jaffa to Caesarea if the traffic is good. Uh, walking could take upwards of a day and a half, maybe longer, depending on how fast you walk. And how hot it is. Boy, it gets hot in the summertime. So while Peter's men were walking, I should say Cornelius's men were walking, Peter was up on the flat rooftop of Simon's house praying, and he fell into a trance, and the Spirit gave him a profound vision, instructing him to follow Cornelius's men to Caesarea. The vision, anything including unkosher animals that God has made clean, are, is kosher. The application, Peter would find out... <laughs> once he got to Caesarea, and boy, was he in for a surprise. In Africa, even the most basic medical aid is often non-existent. 
It is a continent that has been ravaged by disease. Malaria, tuberculosis, HIV and AIDS are unrelenting. Every man, woman and child suffers from a lack of adequate health care. Even treatable illnesses like diarrhea and upper respiratory infections can prove deadly. Clinics are too few and often beyond the reach of those in rural areas. Wow, working for orphans and widows is equipping mobile medical clinics with knowledge and tools to reach out to the sick. Trained nurses are treating the ill. Communities are being educated on hygiene and disease prevention. Voluntary counseling and testing for HIV and AIDS is also offered through the clinic. Fear of stigma and discrimination keeps many from being tested for HIV. Nurses address this issue. They work to provide emotional and medical support for those who test positive for the virus. Communities are being transformed through education and medical treatment brought by mobile clinics. Knowledge about disease transmission is changing behaviors and preventing many illnesses. Basic health care prevents needless deaths. Voluntary counseling and testing has also curbed the spread of AIDS. Many people have learned a lot about HIV AIDS. Since we are taught, we are trained as community health workers, we have the knowledge, we give it to them, even through role plays and everything, even by talking to them as we go in the villages. So now people are aware what HIV AIDS is, how it can be prevented, how it can be infected and all that. By supporting WOWS, Working for Orphans and Widows mobile medical clinics, you can bring hope to countless communities. You can save a life. For those of you who are familiar with this program, you know that 22 years ago, my wife and I founded WOW, Working for Orphans and Widows, and you see it promoted on the show. Working in Africa with uh, orphans and widows victimized by HIV and AIDS, and then the double whammy of COVID-19. Also in India, but now we're working in Ukraine with churches who are providing safety and support for orphans and widows fleeing that war. I've been telling you about that over the last few weeks. You've been responding with great support, helping us to help them. And I just want you to know that support is reaching them. I just sent another tranche of funds just two days ago, and I will keep doing it as you keep doing it. Together, we're going to make a difference in the lives of hundreds, if not thousands, of orphans and widows over the next several months. And I just want to thank you for what you're doing. Log on to wildmission.com. You can give through there. You'll see instructions how to give. There's several options. But I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for what you're doing for Ukraine.